Hello again and welcome to another edition of From the Top. Now anyone who knows anything about Canadian beer, particularly not those really large breweries, I bet you one of the first names that springs to mind is Sleeman. And my next guest is almost as famous as the beer. <laughs> John, John Sleeman, thank you very much indeed for it's coming It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Now, I don't know if there are many people who would not know that you didn't sort of just move into the family brewing business. Give me a little bit of a background on how that started and then stopped. Okay, well, the, the Sleemans are actually from Cornwall in England. Back in the 1600s, they were actually, the name was actually spelled S-L-Y-M-A-N, Sleeman, and they were pirates. So the Sleemans used to hang lanterns, Sleemans used to hang lanterns on the shore near St. Ives in Penzance and They were Helston. wreckers. They were wreckers. <laughs> we like to call ourselves pirates because it sounds a little more romantic. <laughs> anyway, the, the family did that for a few years, maybe a hundred or so, and then uh, got, uh, got directed by Her Majesty or His Majesty that they probably should stop doing that. And uh, they stayed on shore and built bars and pubs. Well, I guess they weren't called bars, but pubs and... Inns, and I suppose. Inns. inns. Yeah. And, and made their own beer to supply those inns and then gradually faded out of the inns part and concentrated on the brewing part. And by 1834, one branch of the family left England and came to Canada, settled not far from here in St. Catharines, near that area, built a brewery, ran it for a few years until about 1850, moved to Guelph because the water was better, and brewed there till 1933 when by then it was in my grandfather's generation and he had been sent to Ottawa to build a couple of breweries there and be an agent for the Sleeman beer. And uh, his brothers were left in Guelph to run the business and his brothers got caught smuggling to the Americans during Prohibition, the likes of Al Capone, who I, I gather was quite a good paying customer. He really um, had, had enough money. I think well, I, I don't think he was running short, no. Right. And I guess we got caught. And the Canadian government in those days didn't seem to mind if you were smuggling as long as you paid your tax. And they had something called an export tax. And you could say you were sending it to the Caribbean or the French islands in the St. Lawrence or something like that. They'd stamp your documents, you'd pay them a tax, and then they'd look the other way. And I gather my ancestors <laughs> didn't reckon much to paying tax on smuggled beer. So eventually, and they'd been doing it for years apparently, mm -hmm. so eventually they got caught and the family just stayed away from the beer business for 50 years. I I understand, sorry to interrupt. No, I understand that actually uh, it was a dry house. You didn't have any alcohol mm -hmm. in your house. Yes, you've yeah, done your research very any well, Any reason John. for that? Um, it may well have been. I mean, we really didn't discuss the, the Sleeman heritage in the house. Um, my parents never really discussed why they didn't drink. It was just, it just, I got the impression it wasn't something that was important to them or they particularly perhaps didn't want to be reminded about the past. So growing up in Ottawa mm. and, and not having any alcohol in the house, it was easy not to know about or know very much about the Sleeman heritage. And I really didn't until I um, dropped out of school and left home and went to live in England. And as you know, being from England, mm. the pubs are great and the beer is great. And I particularly enjoyed that part. So when you were at school, were you um, tremendously good at athletics? Were you very clever, top of the class? I'm um, certainly not very clever. I really just didn't see any value in staying in school, which makes me like 99% of the other students who go to school. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, most of them stay there. Yeah, thankfully, my parents gave in and let me quit. Most other parents don't let their children quit school. I good. certainly wouldn't let my any. I do not have not will not let any of my children quit school. So that was you could say that was good of them. Or why, why did they? Well, I wasn't doing very well in my studies. It may well be they got tired of taking phone calls and letters from the teachers. Um, I enjoyed grade nine so much I did it twice. And so by the time I got to grade 11, maybe they thought, you know, <laughs> this, guy, this guy is a lost cause. So they let me quit school and they let me get a job and start working when I was, I guess, 16 or 17. Doing what? Anything I could. Actually, the best <coughs> job I had as, as a kid uh, in my opinion, was working at McDonald's. And, and people go, McDonald's, why do you say that's a good job? Isn't that just a two or three months part-time at school? Well, I didn't have school, so it was a full-time job. And here's an organization that 
is able to do stuff that parents aren't. Kids won't listen to their parents when they say, you know, clean your fingernails, wash your hair, show up on time, be polite to people, be organized. You know, if your parents say that to you, you'll do the opposite. Yeah. But maybe a girl will be nice and do those things. A boy, not so much. But at McDonald's, uh, somehow when there's a paycheck attached and you've got somebody who's your boss, um, it makes an impression. And um, th I, I credit them with making me get up out of bed in the morning instead of sleeping, you know. So then you went to Britain. At some then sense. I went what, to Britain. What, did you have any inspiration, anyone that you suddenly thought, gosh, he's got some good ideas? Or well, um, the reason for going to Britain was I married a girl from Britain, married in Britain, and uh, uh, lived in Nottingham, and I quite liked it. Um, and uh, my father-in-law uh, very kindly got me a job in the telecommunications company he was working in. So I lived there and I worked there. Uh, but after a while, you know, my desire to be an entrepreneur and work for myself became apparent that it's very difficult, or at least it was in whatever year this was, the 70s, to do it in England. Um, the entrepreneur bit obviously is now surfacing. Uh, is it because you just didn't want to work with a, a an organization well, or you want to do your own thing? How I, did that work? As I look back, I realize one constant theme is I'm not very good at taking direction from people. I'm a bit stubborn, very opinionated, or so I'm told. Apparently, I'm a perfectionist, although I don't see myself in any of those lights. I think I'm a very relaxed, chilled kind of guy, but apparently that's not the case. I think perfectionists are perfectionists because they don't see themselves as perfectionists. Yes, you might. You know, <laughs> if, if there are any uh, psychiatrists or psychologists watching this show, they probably just turn the TV off thinking I'm absolutely without hope. <laughs> In any case, um, I always <coughs> wanted to work for myself because I, when I was working for other people, I would constantly, I can hear myself to this day, I would be critical saying, well, why don't you do it this way? Or it would be better if you did it that way. And you know, Bosses after a while go, well, if you're that bloody smart, go out there and do it yourself. Um, and so I went out there and decided I'd just rather do it myself. Was so I came back from living in England and, and really enjoyed the pubs, liked the beer, thought, why not build a pub? There weren't very many in those days, so I built a pub in Oakville with the help of my uh, first wife. This and is her back father. in Canada. This is back here in Canada. I'll tell you what, we'll just take a quick break. Okay. Now we've got back to beer again. We'll have a quick break and we'll be back shortly. Welcome back, and we've now got back to Canada again, and we're sniffing around at some beer. So you started a, a brewery. Well, like, we a started pub. with a pub. I, I really enjoyed the pubs in, uh, in England, in Scotland, in Wales, and Ireland. And when I came back here to live, I, I worked for a little while for a market research company called AC Nielsen very famous firm. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And um, but I have to say my heart was in building a pub. So fortunate enough to be able to put a little bit of money together from bank loans and various other things and built a pub in uh, Oakville, west of Toronto. Wanted to have authentic British draft beer because there really wasn't any at the time or mm -hmm. not very much of it available. Now it's ubiquitous. Um, and so uh, went back to the United Kingdom and knocked on the doors of Britain's largest breweries and said, how would you like to have an agent in Canada importing and distributing your draft beer? And um, to my amazement and pleasure, they all said, sure. Great. We don't have anybody. Um, and that kind of went to my, my philosophy of if you don't ask, you don't get. I mean, what's the worst thing they can say? No. Chances are they'll say yes, or there'll be some combination. But if you don't approach people, you don't get anywhere. So I think that's one of the pro things about a good entrepreneur and a bad one. So many people just give up as soon as someone doesn't answer an email. It, it's, it's easy to, to give up. Um, and I think you're right, the, the mark, maybe not of a good entrepreneur, but certainly someone who's dedicated to the idea he or she has <coughs> is someone that doesn't give up after the first negative response or the, ner the first five or six negative responses because once I got agreements from you know Bass and Scottish and Newcastle and Guinness and all of these very large breweries um, I came back to Canada thinking it would be easy only to find that the provincial liquor boards in various provinces said oh you can't do that so it, it meant that you had to I had to our company had to be flexible 
because our end goal was how do I get beer from the United Kingdom into the hands of the consumer? And uh, you know, when I speak to, to classes at universities about entrepreneurial studies, one of the things I say is, you know, you have a goal, whatever your goal is, think of it as a road map, say from here to Ottawa. You need to get to Ottawa and you would normally go the 401 and up 16 or whatever. If that road is blocked, you still want to get to Ottawa, you have to find a way around it. So when you're building a business or coming up with an idea for your own entrepreneurial venture, don't give up the first time you hear that the 401's closed in Oshawa. You know, exactly. Find a way yeah. to get around it. And if you really believe in what you want to do, you'll find a way. And I think one of the early factors in deciding who's going to be successful and who isn't is, what do you do when you come across some roadblocks? So, as I was running uh, with my partners running this imported beer company, that's when my aunt showed up from Ottawa and paid me a visit and said, I have I love this, this story. Yes, I have this old old bottle and uh, this old recipe book which I have saved and it's now 51 years after 1984 is when she came to see me and she said I you know here's a recipe book it's your grandfather's it's in his handwriting you should have it I'm giving it to you love you to start the business <coughs> and I said why in the world would I want to give up this successful beer importing business um, which was very strong cash flow, didn't have much in the way of capital requirements. You rent a warehouse, you put some beer in it, you mark it up, you sell it, you deliver it. It's pretty simple stuff. And Why not would time I consuming, so you're able to be at home and that sort of thing? Yeah, I was actually getting home at reasonable hours and I mean, traveling to see business in other parts of the country, but um, why would I give that up to invest millions of dollars in building a brewery competing directly with Molson Labatt, Carling Amstel, who were the individual players at the time, yeah. and only to discover that they're bigger and smarter and wealthier than I am, and this is going to be a colossal failure. And um, to your earlier comment, the way she got me to do it was guilt. Well, I'm getting old, and I'd really like you to do this for me before I pass away. Rats, you know. <laughs> I said to her, uh, all right, well, why don't I have a look at it? If we're going to do this, I, should, I would like to try and get back the original company name, the, in, the incorporation. And um, when the family lost the brewing business, the facilities stayed there. And in order to pay some of the fines, the family had to sell the business. And they sold it to a company called Standard Brands, which is now part of Nabisco. Right. Yep. So what I needed to do was get in touch with Nabisco and say, I'm John Sleeman. I'm, I understand you're the people who bought Sleeman Breweries. You changed the name. It's now inactive. I'd like to restart it, but you own the company. Can I have it back? And, and I was kind of hoping they'd say no, because then I could say to Florian, oh, shucks, I tried. <laughs> um, but they didn't. To my, my surprise, they said, pay us a dollar. You can have the company back. Really? We think it's a great idea to restart your family business. So now I have a recipe yeah. book, an old bottle, I have the company name, and I have the trademark, and I'm, bluntly, I'm running out of reasons. You're stuffed, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I'm stuffed. I'm running out of reasons <laughs> not to restart the business. Right. So um, it was important to me, continues to be important to me, that the, the business was restarted in Guelph, where, it, where its ancestral home is. Um, the original buildings, some of them were still there, but they had now become surrounded by the city and, and I wasn't going to be allowed to have the, the business restart in residential areas. So I uh, found a piece of property on the outskirts of town and built a brewery. And, and in your case, you must have relied on very good staff. That must be very important. Well, uh, each business that I've started, so the three, the pub, the beer importing company, and, and the brewery. In each case, I have been forced by the people around me to give up more and more of my day-to-day -day micromanaging. And there's this very interesting correlation. The less I micromanage, the bigger and more successful the company is. Oh, You'd think I'd message. get the bloody message. Um, and I think it's very difficult. <coughs> it, it has been for me and I suspect it may well be difficult for a lot of other entrepreneurs to actually trust that somebody might be better at something than you are. And I remember the CFO um, of, the, the first CFO of the brewery sat me down one day when I'm sure he was losing his patience with me. Probably his staff begged him to have a word with me. 
And he said, look, Subtly. yes, here's a baseball <laughs> bat. Um, you can have control over a very small company and run it yourself and have whatever personal wealth comes with that. But you're absolutely going to be in control. Or you can let some other people make the decisions that you're no good at, and you can be in charge of a very large company and be quite wealthy. So why don't you go and think about mm -hmm. that, and we'll talk tomorrow. <laughs> and it was, it, you know, it was the was first. Was that uh, fairly early on? Uh, that was probably 1990. We started oh, okay. in 88, so right. probably yeah, yeah. two years into it. And I was having fun, but I was just in everybody's way. And I thought I was helping, and I thought I was crafting the image that I wanted of this business. And I guess what, in fact, I was doing, they knew very well what my mission and vision and values were before it was cool to have those things. You want to make good beer, and you want to make a lot of money. Really, John, it's not hard. We got it. Um, so, yeah, probably two years in, and he finally said, you know, big or small, what do you want? Because if you want big, and you want to be national, maybe international, and wildly successful, and a bottle of your beer in everybody's fridge, can you just let us do our job? Really, trust us. Which would make one think then that, okay, fine, so now you relaxed a bit and didn't do so much, but I don't think that well, happened, did it? what it was was, okay, we'll build a brewery, I'll let you make the beer in this brewery. Fine, I'll butt out. But I really don't want to just have one brewery. I want to have breweries across Canada. Well, okay, John, go and find some breweries. Talk to the owners of those breweries. See if they'd like to sell. Make the deal. Come back. You make the deals. And then give it to us, and we'll run it. And it turned out that I was enjoying that and had some level of success. And we went from one brewery in Guelph to four breweries across the country. And my goal was a national group of breweries, best quality, I, never, I knew I was never going to be the size of Molson Labatt, but I wanted to be substantial and I wanted mm -hmm. to have a good reputation for quality, et cetera, et cetera. And it became apparent that the way I could get to that goal the fastest was to find out who had a similar goal, maybe no aspiration to be a national company, but I'd like to be a really strong beer, a uh, strong company making beer for people in Quebec. Well, who's the best one doing that? Unibrew. Well, let's go and talk to the people at Unibrew. And so we did that across the country, and we were able to learn from my mistakes at the purchase of Upper Canada to the point where we, when we purchased breweries, the name stayed up there. The people stayed employed by that company. We took the good things they were doing, and we didn't change them. And if they had some things they needed help with, whether it was on the technical side or the accounting side or the marketing side, where we could improve, we did. And where our involvement was going to screw things up, we didn't change anything. I'm going to stop you there a sec because it's time for another break. We'll be back shortly. Okay, so the brewery is up and running. We've got great people. Um, families uh, getting there. So-so, yeah. So you've, you've learned all that now. Your, your second marriage, have you changed at all? Have you said, right, I'm going to spend more time at home or are you still working flat out? Uh, I'm still working flat out. I'm, I used to work weekends as well as Monday to Friday and um, I've decided not to do that. I used to make more public appearances. I used to do more interviews. I used to yep. work in pubs in the evening and do promos. So I try to, to not do those things, um, not because I don't enjoy them. I, I do. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're silly enough to have a company and name it after yourself, then you shouldn't bitch about the fact when, you know, you've got some notoriety and people want to see you and it's part of growing the business. So I don't complain about it, but I am enjoying a little bit more time with my family. Um, I don't know whether they're enjoying having me home, but I'm still at the office most nights at 7 o'clock. If you were to give advice to, to, to people starting now, Anything you would have changed that you'd have done differently? Um, no, I don't think, I mean, I don't think I would. Sometimes people say, would you have stayed in school longer? Would you have got a university education? I know it's very difficult these days for kids who drop out of school to, to make their lives successful. But um, I'm, I'm afraid that if I had stayed in school and gone to university and I, I would have missed those years when I was in the workforce learning, building something, 
I also might have had that desire to take risk just drilled out of me. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think I'd change anything. You think that's a, a thing that hasn't had, that happens to lots of people that in those formative years they get the, the risk taking drilled out? Yeah, I mean there is a very good reason that the military forces of the world stick 19 and 20 year olds in the seat of a fighter pilot because you think you won't fail, you think you won't die, you will be successful and live forever. You don't generally have a wife and kids and a mortgage and all of those things. Well, I think some of that is true as well. The later you leave it in your life to start a business and take risk, the more you have to lose. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're 19 and you don't owe anybody anything, in my case I had a wife, but I didn't have children until I was in my 20s, to me that's the time to take the risks. And my philosophy is now uh, I know I'm not smart enough to do everything myself, but if I'm running the business, hopefully I've got enough money to hire the kids who went to university, hire the MBAs, hire the accountants, hire the marketing guys, hire the plant and production guys, because they've got the training. I've got the ideas and the drive, and then you bring in the people who have the expertise that you don't have. And I just think that uh, while it is never too late to start a business, I'm not suggesting that. I think human nature is the more you have to lose, the less you're willing to risk it. A lot of people today, a lot of youngsters today, that the goal is to make money, make money quickly, mm -hmm. and then retire and do something, whatever that is. <laughs> and otherwise, enjoy yourself, because it's almost um, universally felt that you, you don't enjoy your job. You know what, I, uh, somebody very smart, probably very famous, said something about if you enjoy your job, you don't ever really have a job. It's not like going to work. I love what I have done for a living since I was 19 or 20 years old. I have absolutely no plans to retire. Um, if I should ever leave Sleeman, I will do something else. I intend to die at my desk or driving a truck or building a business. Um, I, I love what I do. I don't, you know, maybe Monday morning after staying up too late watching yeah. Sunday night football, I think, gee, that wasn't very good planning. But I still love going but to work. But you do it again. Absolutely. And there must be repetition at every job, however exciting, even if you're a fighter pilot. There are times you get, oh God, it's this again. You must, there you are know, the only th the thing, the only thing I hate about my job, and I have never liked it, is having to fire people. I mean, if you steal from me, I can, f I, I can get up for that, you know. Steal from me, mm -hmm. you're gone. <coughs> but these days, you know, you have corporate restructurings and all of these things, I hate that. Because I imagine that person having to go home to his or her spouse and say, I don't have a job. Well, what did you do? What's wrong? Well, I didn't do anything, but there was a restructuring. And a few years ago, yeah. Sleeman went through a tough patch. And um, we had to cut the, sale, cut the workforce by, by 10%. And, you know, we had a whole bunch of really good people that didn't deserve to lose their jobs. And I, I hate that. What, what keeps you awake? What, what do you fear most, if anything, in life? Dying before I get everything done. <laughs> I got a whole lot I'm of stuff. I'm afraid you might do that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I hear it does happen. Yeah, once or twice. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I love what I do and I, I want to do more. So finally, last piece of advice. Chaps, just woman, man, just finished MBA, young, dying to do something. What would your advice be? Think of something that you enjoy doing, tremendously enjoy doing, and see if there's a way you can make money at it. Drinking obviously isn't included. Well, you may not make money out of that. Unless you own a bar. That's the problem. No, but you really should have a job that feels like you're playing all the time. John, thank you very much indeed for being here. It's been great fun chatting to you. I've enjoyed it. And thank I you. hope you do live forever. I plan I to. I love the beer. I plan to. Thank you. It's been <laughs> thank fun you being here. Thank you very much indeed. And that brings an end to the show today. John Sleeman was my guest, and what a fantastic life. This is John Myers of Black Isle. See you again next time.